Welcome to yet another exciting episode of Startins. Today, I'd like to introduce a passionate personality, a technical leader, and a person with an innovative bent of mind who has conceptualized and built world-class products touching billions of lives. Welcome, Dr. Vinod Peris. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thank you, Rama, and you're very kind. Thank you so much. I have one question for you, Vinod. Um, looking at the journey that you have taken from building core routers to campus switching software to SaaS solutions, and now the key element, the cybersecurity, would like to get your perspective on your journey. That, that's a great question. And um, it's, it's been a long time. So first of all, you're making me feel old. It looks like I've been around for a long time. But um, in many ways, you know, reflecting on the journey, things, there's lots of things that have remained the same. At the heart of it, you have instructions that are executing on some CPU. But lots of things have changed as well. If you look at the environment, we're no longer dealing with hardware. Most cases, people are really writing software that runs on an instance in the cloud. If you look at the tools that we use, I recall in the early days building some of this, um, these routers and switches, you actually programmed in C, in a language that was close to the hardware. Nowadays, the focus is more on Python and Java and so forth, right? And also, if you think about the processes that, that we do, in the past, building software took three to four years. You had the hardware, you had an operating system, you had applications, you had to do a lot of things and delivering it to the customer as well took a long time. Now, you can pretty much release something in a matter of weeks, get feedback from the customer and iterate. And that to me actually is the biggest thing. The ability to iterate with the customer, that's what makes this time that we are in special because you can make progress really quickly and deliver value very quickly. So, so that's kind of been my journey and God knows what's, what's ahead, you know. Great, awesome. So being in the industry for almost 25 years now, what were the challenges you faced during your journey? And would you like to share your stories of overcoming them? You know? Sure, as you point out, Anil, it, it's been a long time. 25 years and uh, you know, so there are so many challenges for me to, uh, to remember and to think of. And actually I want to say that sometimes challenges are beyond work as well. You know, the whole thing about balancing your work, your life and you know, challenges outside work may be harder in some cases, right? But just for this chat, if we focus on work, I was trying to think about, you know, what's a class of challenges that may be applicable to most people? And one of the things that I faced often was really challenges dealing with customer issues and customer problems. If you think about it, if you have a really successful product, you're guaranteed to have customer issues. And the natural tendency for human beings, and I'm no different, is to kind of try and shy away from them because they are a headache. That means for several days you'll be off, you know, trying to solve this problem and it will disrupt your schedule, right? But what I have found you know, to be really, really useful is to embrace these head on. In fact, take on the most difficult one. Why? Because when you do this, a lot of good things happen. First of all, you build a relationship with that customer. You're trying to solve somebody's problem. They will tell you whatever you know, you need to know to solve the problem. If you go independently unsolicited and ask them, tell me about your, you know, environment, network, they won't have time for you. When there's a problem, you will do that. So you'll build a relationship. Second, you will actually learn a lot from them, which will help you both in your current product and in your future life, right? And what I have found, uh, I'll give you an example. This happened several years ago there was an issue with a large service provider. This is when I was at Cisco, right? And, um, you know, this was a, a private network they were providing to a third party and it was literally melting down, right? And they had no idea what was going on. They identified it was multicast. This was on some legacy 
hardware, there was nobody at Cisco who was raising their hand to do to take care of this. So somebody called me, uh, uh, somebody fairly high up in the management chain. And uh, I think I just didn't know how to say no, I landed up there, right? And when I landed up, I realized it was a big mess because first of all, it was a very high profile customer and uh, you know it was elevated to the SVPs with the uh, service provider. And they wanted updates every you know, four hours until the problem was solved. And so needless to say, that night, you know, pretty much we all stayed awake and then we was giving them updates for two weeks. I won't go into the whole story here, but I learned so much at the end of that, that um, you know, the customer was you know, really happy and impressed that we had ultimately found, found this, this problem. And I had the full resources at Cisco to work with because this was an important customer. And so through all of that, not only did we solve this customer's problem, but my stature in Cisco really increased as a result of this. And so this is an example where, you know, taking this head on, even where if it's uncomfortable in life is actually a good thing. And it's a little counterintuitive, but I encourage people to do that because that's how, you know, you can really make your mark and learn a lot. I know that was a long answer. I'm sorry uh, <laughs> if, if it was too long for you. Well, that was awesome. Very insightful. Very insightful, um, Vinod. Really appreciate it. Now, switching gears. Now it is digital era where there are smart machines, smart systems, smart softwares. Everything smart is latching on to something called as internet and everybody is providing software as a service. That brings in the key element, which is security, which is much required. I uh, would like to get your insights on the, the way things are happening in the enterprise world. Thank you, Rama. This is a very interesting trend that we are actually, I would say, fairly in the middle of right now. And initially, if you see, enterprises were reluctant to take on you know, SaaS applications. And for exactly the reason you mentioned, right? because security. And, and it's more as fear, if you will, because they don't control it. They think that all bad things can happen, right? But let's address what makes SaaS actually so um, effective, right? So first, it's very easy to access. If you look at the old way of you know de uh, deploying enterprise software, it basically involved lots of investment. You you had to you know install it. You had to have people to manage it, support it, maintain it, and all of that stuff. Now with SaaS, you don't need any of that. You don't need upfront investment. You can cancel it at any time. It allows for this rapid iteration that I talked about earlier. And typically, SaaS applications are easy to use for for you know a variety of reasons. And so, what the world I think is now you know, coming to realize is that the advantages outweigh this fear. And in many cases, this fear of security is unfounded because just because I, you know, or some of my enterprise, my colleagues are responsible for security, it doesn't mean it makes it safer. And for a company that's, um, you know, providing service, uh, software as a service, since that's their main focus, it's relatively uh, simpler for them to focus on securing that application. So that's what you see now, um, you know, more and more as a, as a trend is that enterprises are willing to trust SaaS applications. They do have fairly rigorous, you know, criteria and questionnaires and requirements that they put in place for third parties. But uh, I, I see the world actually moving and there's no turning back. Awesome. So world is talking about design and design first approach. And uh, today when enterprise applications are there to better display complex functionalities and rich components, what do you suggest is the best approach to achieve a simple clutter free yet intuitive solution? That's a great, great question. Anil. Um, you know, it's funny. When, when you look at the world today, you actually, and we are living in unique times, right? Because many of us have straddled both. We've seen enterprise applications of old, you know, like SAP, Oracle, all, all the big uh, 
uh, enterprise companies. And if you think about it, they're all fairly complex. They're complex to use, they're complex to implement, you know, you require experts and so forth. And if you think about it, it's not very surprising how they got there because those features and the requirements were dictated by experts. And you build this, you sell it to the biggest company, like let's say you sell it to IBM or somebody like that, which has lots of resources, some very smart people, they will come and tell you, I want this, 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 and this. And so you want to get the million dollar contract, you are going to do all this, 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 and this, and give it to them, right? And when you have lots of requirements, software becomes complex. You flip it and you look at consumer applications, right? You look at iPhone, you look at Slack, or you look at, you know, things like bill.com, Expensify, things that are moving towards the enterprise as well. They be, are simple because of democratization. What do, what do I mean here? It's like, they have thousands of users and every user counts as one. It's no like, you know, big user, small user typically, right? And so through all of that, you know, crowdsourcing, if you will, they are able to quickly, they're able to first of all, get feedback quickly. And secondly, they are forced to make it simple, easy to use because otherwise thousands of people will not use this thing, right? And then they use data. They use typically telemetry you know, applications like Mixpanel, Hotjar, all of these to get this customer feedback and iterate over it. So that's how, if you see the enterprise applications and the consumer applications have evolved di differently. And typically you will see consumer applications are simpler and you know more intuitive to use, right? And now that is bleeding over to the enterprise side. That's why the ones I mentioned like Slack, uh, Build.com, Expensify, all of these, they are relatively straightforward to use. They're nothing like, you know, the old enterprise applications that we used to have. And I think, again, this is a trend that you will see more and more that uh, the days of complex monolith software is gone. It's going to be simple. Um, yeah, and for many other reasons as well. We also are much more used to simple things thanks to our mobile phone and, you know, things like that, right? Thank you so much. I completely agree with you. I think years back, even when I started my career back in the 90s, um, some of the legacy softwares, the features and functionalities were defined by the business. So they went on adding to it and they reached a point where when you have to redesign it and make it user-centric, there was a massive challenge. Okay, my question is, what do you think is the role of designers, be it UI, UX or product, for having a very highly intuitive enterprise solution. I'm sure in your career path, you would have worked with designers or maybe design studios or even within Cisco and other organization, you would have dealt with design team. So what do you think, how important is it to have such department or to have such talent to plan an enterprise solution? It's hugely important, Anil, if you see, UX is really the difference between your software being used by somebody or ending up as shelfware, right? And so I can tell you how in the last several years, you know, um, I'm focusing more and more on making sure we have UX people up front. And it's not just the design or, you know, user interface or those kind of things, right? It's the whole workflow. And I'll tell you the few things that you know, I, I follow, right? One is you need to study really the persona of the user. What type of user is using your product? And especially in the enterprise space, it's quite broad, right? Because it could be a technical person. It may be somebody non-technical. Again, depends on your product. You need to know that, right? The second is they may be looking for specific data to do their job. You need to know what is it that they're looking for? What data, what columns, what entries, right? You also need to know their tolerance in terms of response time, how long they'll wait, you know, screens, those kind of things, right? And really, once you have the persona, you want to think about their workflow. Ideally, you want to have somebody look over their shoulder as they're using the product. This is something that's becoming popular recently. It's called ethnographic research. So it's not just calling them and saying, what do you want? What do you like? 
It's like, here, just take this, use it. I just want to just ignore me. I'll sit in the corner. I'll watch what you're doing, right? That would be ideal. If you can get that, it's expensive, but it's well worth it, right? So once you have that understanding, you know, of the, the workflow, you want to also know, you know, what value they're getting out of your product. This is something that is important because if you if they're not able to get value out of your product, even though it's easy to use and everything, they're not going to use it. They're going to get bored and move on, right? And then finally, it's not just one-time value. What you want ideally is for them to keep coming back, keep coming back every day, every week, you know, every month. I mean, we've seen examples of these, right? Obviously, consumer is different, but you saw in Facebook the way they you know, created their news feed and things like that, just to kind of incite you to go every day, every month. Now, that's more on the entertainment side. On the business side, it has to be giving them value in terms of what work they are doing. And that is, it's all easy for me to say. These are not easy things to do. And this is what really the challenge of UX is, is today. But uh, it's supremely important. Um, and at least in you know my business, in my um, engineering team, I'm focusing more and more on UX right now. So that was a great question, uh, Anil. I think today we are celebrating design and even design is in the limelight. It's purely because of leaders like you who have um, considered design. And uh, I could clearly say that one, one of the reasons why leaders like you are so successful because you have adopted to every change that has happened. I'm so nice to hear uh, that every practice that we do here at Design, you were speaking about it, be it ethnography, be it iterative, be it user-centric. It's so nice to hear from leaders like you. I think world needs people like you to make sure that every product has a design-first approach. Thank you so much, Vinod. You're you. very kind. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Vinod. This was a great learning for us, be it in terms of customer acquisition strategy or customer retention strategy, which you laid out for us. Appreciate your time, energy, and all the knowledge that you imparted in this session. Chatting with you and... Uh... You know, um, I'm very happy to be able to both have this conversation and be able to help others as well. So what keeps you going, you know, apart from work? I see people in other part of the world, they balance their life so well. They're either into cycling, motorbike, or some sort of uh, physical uh, exercise or something that keeps them going. With the 25 yeah. years of your ups and downs, and what is that that keeps you going? And even Zumba. our leader, Rama, is into Zumba and she's so fit <laughs> and she, she kind of get, brings that energy whenever she walks into the office. And what, yeah, what no, is that? It's, it's really good actually to have some other outlet for your energy. So uh, several years ago, um, I picked up running, okay, this is more than a dozen years ago. And uh, it just started on a whim. I'd never really run much in my life. But before I knew it, I was, you know, training for a marathon. I've run several marathons and uh, it's harder and harder to run 26 miles. So I haven't done that in the last two or three years, but I do keep running. In fact, the one thing I've done during COVID times, I managed to go running every single day since there's nothing else to do. So whenever there is an hour break in my schedule, I just put on my running shorts. I go for a run and I come back. But uh, that's that's my my little uh, side side gig, if you will. Awesome, great! Thank you so much, Vinod. So Thank much you, to Anil. Again, pleasure meeting you, Anil, and nice connecting with you, Rama. Take care. Thank you.